I believe it's customary to say uh, at times like this something like, Noam Chomsky needs no introduction. <laughs> Particularly true in his case, he is in fact in scholarly literature the most cited intellectual figure still living. Quite a remarkable thing. Uh, so, I'm not going to bother introducing him. I'm going to talk about some other stuff. <laughs> Karl Marx once said, history repeats itself. The first time is tragedy, the second is farce. What we have been seeing in the past 13 months is history repeating itself, but at such a speeded up pace that events often seem to blur together in our minds. After the horrific attacks of 9-11, we saw the American empire unleashed, just as it was after 1945. In the months that followed, we saw the evolution of a new Cold War, with terrorism replacing communism as the ultimate justification for U.S. intervention in places where the empire builders wanted to intervene anyway. That was the 1950s. More recently, in the past few months, we've seen the American empire insane, as it was in the middle and late stages of the Vietnam War in the late 60s and early 70s. And since Noam Chomsky emerged on the public political scene as the most resolute and incisive critic of that war, it's worth looking at that analogy for a minute. There's some serious differences between that situation and this, but there are also profound similarities. As in Vietnam, the masters of the universe are entering a potentially volatile situation they can't control with the sanguine expectation that extreme force will be enough, will suffice as they think it always has. As in Vietnam, they are risking the stability of a world order already very congenial to them. And as in the late stages of that war, they are hardly able to come up with a justification that couldn't be rebutted by a five-year-old. <laughs> Another similarity, Vietnam opened up for the first time since World War II a real and serious foreign policy debate in this country which went up and down over the years, but was not extinguished until the success of the Gulf War. The recent vote on the use of force resolution against Iraq, in which 156 members of Congress dissented, is quite remarkable. Think about it for a minute. We, with that resolution, we have seen that debate reopened for the first time in over a decade. That's a remarkable achievement. It seems to owe half to a flurry of activism of the kind we've heard about, and have to the unbelievable hubris and dictatorial manner of the Bush administration. That achievement means that now is the time to get involved in the growing anti-war movement. You've heard about the student groups. You've heard about Austin Against War. There's also the Austin Campaign, which focuses on outreach to broader communities. All of these groups have been very active, but they need your help and participation. Now is also a singularly opportune time to hear Noam Chomsky. Any balanced assessment of Chomsky's work and influence sounds like the most egregious sycophancy. So, please forgive me. <laughs> you all have heard of the revolution he initiated in linguistics. I won't say anything about that. But about politics, for 40 years, he has been an exceptional, remarkably articulate analyst and critic of U.S. foreign policy. Vietnam, Cambodia, Israel, East Timor, Central America, Libya, Panama, Iraq, Somalia, Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, economic liberalization, free trade, the assault of the right in the United States, the assault of free market fundamentalism, all of this is just a small part of Chomsky's oeuvre. One of his most significant uh, contributions, in fact, above and beyond all this is his demolition of the mythology of liberal imperialism, which is what ruled and shaped the world order created after 1945. When Gandhi died, George C. Marshall said that Gandhi had become the spokesman for the conscience of all mankind. There is an unfortunate tendency, I think, among many in the movement here to put Chomsky in that position. It's true, if that position made any sense, Chomsky would be the one to put there. For 40 years, he has been honest, he has been straightforward, he has never, never kowtowed to the demands of respectability, to the demands of being mainstream, of being acceptable. 
One of the most important things he did was demolish the mythology that liberal intellectuals are somehow the repository of civilization and righteousness and humanity, and that the best thing for all of us would be to allow them to order the world for us. In one of his great essays on the responsibility of intellectuals, he said, the responsibility of intellectuals is to speak the truth and expose lies. Not a particularly remarkable statement, but what's remarkable is that he showed so clearly how few intellectuals actually do that. Chomsky takes it as axiomatic that power will create an ideology to justify itself and that intellectuals, as the architects of that ideology, will naturally serve power and not the truth. He takes it as axiomatic and then like he does with so many other things, proves it in copious and sometimes agonizing detail. <laughs> He quotes from an essay of Dwight MacDonald. There's, a, there's an incident with a death camp paymaster, a bureaucrat in one of the Nazi death camps. He's been captured after the war, and he is told the Russians are going to hang him for what he's done. He bursts into tears and says, Why? What have I done? Chomsky concludes it by comparing the average liberal intellectual making justifications for the Vietnam War with that death campaign master. It turns out liberal intellectuals like the rest of us hate being compared with death campaign masters. <laughs> and ever since then, he has been cordially hated by the vast majority of our intellectual culture and of our intellectuals. But that's not important to him. Chomsky doesn't speak truth to power. He's not particularly interested in that. He cherishes no illusion that power will change its course if it learns the truth. He does something far more important. He speaks truth to the powerless, to the people, and not just to them, but with them. Not just as a voice of authority, but as one particularly important, but one voice in a much larger movement. His challenge to you is not to put him up as a spokesman for the conscience of humanity, but for all of you, every day, in whatever way you can, hopefully with as much dedication and verve and energy remarkable in the man of his age as Chomsky does. He wants all of you to be spokesmen for your own consciences in every way you can. That is the challenge put before you. The real question before us here today is not whether Chomsky is brilliant or whether he's a great speaker. He is all of those things. The real question before us is what will we do? What will we make of the truth that we see and that we create here today? Please join me in welcoming Mel Johnson. Be using 
uh, the word terror in a technical sense, that's not in accord with its actual meaning or even its official definition in the U.S. Code and the Army manuals, uh, but a technical sense in which the term terror is restricted to the use of terror by uh, them against us and excludes another category, namely the terror that we and our clients and allies carry out against whoever they may be, uh, which is often much worse. Uh, this technical usage is universal and unchallengeable, uh, and I'll keep to it, as I said reluctantly, but I should emphasize uh, that even to talk about the war on terror uh, is uh, a real display of, extra of uh, extraordinary hypocrisy and uh, uh, moral cowardice, and the fact that it's universal doesn't change that fact. Well, with that said, uh, I want you to understand that I've ever thought about terror. Uh, so talking about the so-called war on terror, uh, the president said, there is no telling how many wars it will take to secure freedom in the homeland, uh, which is fair enough. Uh, there are potential threats everywhere, and they're virtually limitless. And uh, they're, in fact, right here, uh, the uh, anthrax scare is a good example to trace back to federal laboratories. So there's plenty of places to bomb if uh, we want to bomb. <laughs> uh, it's worth paying attention to what's said about these matters by the people with the most experience. Uh, so take the uh, head of uh, Shabbat, the Israeli secret services that uh, uh, run the uh, occupied territories, uh, what I notice are called in Boston the disputed territories. Uh, they're disputed by uh, the U.S. government and the media and nobody else. Uh, <laughs> they are the occupied territories. Uh, he, uh, that, he's the guy who ran up until 2000. Uh, he said that those who want victory against terror want an unending war. Uh, unless they are willing to address underlying grievances. Uh, he's, of course, speaking about uh, Israel-Palestine, where the only solution of the problem of terror is to offer an honorable solution to Palestinians respecting their rights of self-determination. Actually, that's a quote from a predecessor of his, the former head of Israeli military intelligence, Hoshita Harkabi, also a leading Arabist, and that's 20 years ago. Uh, he was speaking after another outbreak of the uh, shocking uh, army settler violence in the occupied territories. Uh, that was a time 20 years ago when Israel uh, retained its immunity from retaliation from within the territories to its uh, harsh and brutal and degrading practices there. And that immunity lasted until recently, so it wasn't what well, the terror that was going on was considered a problem in the United States or the West. Uh, well, these uh, observations generalize in some rather obvious ways. Uh, in serious scholarship, at least, it's recognized universally, as far as I know, I'll quote one example, that unless the social, political, and economic conditions that spawned Al-Qaeda and other uh, associated groups are addressed, the United States and its allies will continue to be targeted by Islamic terrorists. There will be an unending war. And as the CIA pointed out just a couple of weeks ago, and you didn't need an intelligence service to tell you this because it's trivially obvious, uh, the only anticipated terror expected to be linked to Iraq is Saddam's likely reaction to an invasion. Uh, and uh, worst case uh, analysis of that is, uh, which is not entirely implausible, could be pretty horrendous. So there are ways to uh, increase terrorism, if that's what we want to do, uh, namely the ways that are being planned and uh, implemented relentlessly in Washington and Crawford. And they know it, and they understand why, and which tells you how much they care about terrorism. They also know how to deal with it, namely in accord with the 
uh, recommendations of uh, people I've just been quoting, including the CIA and Israeli intelligence. Uh, it's also uh, important to uh, hasten attention that not only to Washington's absolutely massive uh, contribution to international terrorism over the years, continuing, but also to its critical role in establishing the terrorist networks uh, that later um, turned uh, against the West. Now, that's well known, or certainly should be well known, in the case of Al-Qaeda, too well known to talk about. So take a less discussed case, the recent uh, terrorist atrocities in Bali. Uh, uh, they've uh, been less discussed here, that is, it's very much discussed among uh, uh, experts on the region in Australia, where they pay close attention to these matters, quite pretty obvious reasons. Uh, it's uh, generally supposed that the terrorist attack in Bali traces back to Jamaat Islamiya, and that may be true, so let's assume that it's true, the general assumption. Well, what is that? Uh, that's one of the uh, uh, Muslim extremist groups that were formed with the backing of General Suharto, with the firm support of the United States, uh, and the purpose was to link the army, the major terrorist force in Indonesia, as in most countries, to link the army to uh, Muslim extremists. Uh, that's what lay behind uh, the horrendous uh, terrorist at atrocities back in 1965, uh, in which Bali was uh, some of the worst. Uh, it's not a peacekeeping, it's not a peaceful paradise the way it was described. Uh, the atrocities of 1965, uh, New York Times called them a staggering uh, mass slaughter, uh, Time magazine, uh, big front page about a boiling bloodbath. Now the CIA compared them compared, described it as mass murder comparable to uh, Hitler, uh, Stalin, and Mao. Valley was the worst place, and it was uh, grew out of a linkage that had been established between uh, Muslim extremist groups and the Indonesian army, all backed fully by the United States, and in fact greeted with complete euphoria uh, in the United States and the West generally considered a marvelous achievement. Uh, Hope where there once was none, uh, the gleam of light in Asia, quoting some headlines in the New York Times and elsewhere. Uh, it was wonderful. It killed maybe a million people, mostly landless peasants, and uh, uh, poor, poor people destroyed the main mass based popular party in the country, the party of the poor, that eliminated the threat of democracy, which has been a big concern for a long time. Uh, so this was just a fantastic mass slaughter comparable to Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, according to the CIA. Uh, and uh, ballet was the worst place, and it was uh, traceable to that uh, linkage that had been established with U.S. support. Well, those links uh, probably continue, in fact, surely continue, and may be, as some Australian specialists are arguing, uh, linked to or in the background of the latest Bali atrocity. Uh, General Suharto uh, went on to compile one of the worst human rights records in the world. It's fully comparable to Saddam Hussein. And he remained uh, our kind of guy, as the Clinton administration described him in 1995, uh, just as uh, Saddam was our kind of guy, described as a nice moderate by George Bush number one and most of the people in power in Washington now, uh, uh, right through his worst atrocities and beyond. So there's a lot uh, that's familiar in everything that's happening and we want to pay attention. Uh, well, going back to the expectations of the powerful, uh, at least and more generally, uh, one good source to look at, I really urge you, it's a public document if you want to find out about this, uh, is a document called Global Trends 2015. It was released by the U.S. National Intelligence Council, that's the CIA, the PIA, the whole assorted intelligence agencies, with uh, inputs from academic specialists and the corporate world. Uh, this is pre-9-11, pre back in 2000. Uh, they, and they have a lot of long analysis of what they expect to happen for the 
next 15 years. Nothing much has changed after September 11th except new pretexts. Uh, the uh, uh, main prediction that they make is what they call globalization, specific form of international economic integration, it's called globalization and propaganda system. Uh, they uh, predict that globalization will continue on course, I'm quoting it, its evolution will be rocky, marked by chronic financial volatility and a widening economic divide. Okay, that's the prediction. Those of you who have taken uh, Econ 101 uh, know that in theory globalization is supposed to lead to convergence to a unified, single integrated market with a single wage and price. So what they're actually predicting is less globalization in the technical sense, but more globalization in the doctrinally preferred sense, which means that the people who matter uh, will make out like bandits and that the rest, uh, it's not our department. Uh, the increasing financial volatility, that means slower growth, harming mainly the poor. So that's the optimistic prediction. Uh, those uh, projections actually extend uh, previous tendencies. This uh, is usually called outside the United States the neoliberal period, the period that's here called globalization the last 20, 25 years. Uh, has been marked by a very significant deterioration in just by every measure of economic development, uh, rate of growth, uh, productivity growth, investment, even trade. Uh, but, uh, and uh, there are some exceptions, namely countries that didn't follow the rules, but where the rules were followed the most rigorously in places like Latin America is the worst disaster. And in most of the world, including the United States, it's been a pretty very poor period, certainly as compared with the preceding 25 years. And they're expecting that to continue and in fact extend with a widening economic divide and slower growth resulting from more financial volatility. Uh, well, uh, military planners uh, make the same assumptions and they're also available in public documents which you really should read. So Clinton planners, just like this was, uh, published a document a couple of years ago for called Vision for 2020, uh, and it predicts that this is the space demand that the guys who are in charge of uh, you know, putting up the uh, murderous uh, weapons in space that will probably do us all in. Uh, they uh, predict a growing gap between the haves and the have-nots, and they say the have-nots will be against the widening economic divide. Now, the have-nots will become uh, disruptive, uh, they're going to have to be controlled uh, in the interests of what's called stability, which means shutting up and following orders. It's a technical term for it. For the science. Uh, the uh, uh, National Intelligence Council, when they describe it, what they say is that as globalization proceeds, deepening stagnation will foster political, ethnic, ideological, and religious extremism along with violence, uh, much of it directed against the United States. Uh, that's the optimistic prediction. Uh, and there's standard reasons. I mean, just mentioning the reason. Uh, that's part of the motive between the vast uh, expansion of uh, U.S. military power. Uh, and although it's shooting up now, you know, remember what it was before September 11th. I mean, before September 11th, <coughs> U.S. military force uh, completely outweighed any imaginable combination of um, uh, allies or adversaries. And those measures are quite misleading uh, because they don't count a lot of things. They don't count offshore U.S. military bases, which is in effect what Israel is now. It's decided some years ago to become an offshore U.S. military base. And although it's a small country, that means it has huge military force, uh, according to the uh, IDF, the Israeli Army analysts, uh, the uh, uh, air and the naval forces of Israel are larger and more advanced than those of any NATO power, except for the United States, and uh, the armed forces as well. Uh, the, in NATO itself, the major, aside from the U.S., the major military power is Britain. Uh, about 40 years ago, uh, I 
U.S. senior U.S. Uh, statesman described secretly described uh, Britain as, uh, in his words, our lieutenant. Uh, the fashionable word is partner. Uh, the British are supposed to hear the fashionable word, but in Washington they understand the uh, real word. Uh, that's fundamentally part of the U.S. military system too. And if you can, we go on. Turkey, others count these things. It's a military system of uh, incredible power. Uh, uh, 9-11 uh, uh, provided a pretext for uh, increasing the military spending very sharply. It's totally unrelated to terrorism, but it's uh, very closely related to global control and even to maintaining the advanced economy. Uh, the Space Command, which I quoted, explains this pretty well in Visions 2020. Uh, they give a little historical background, which is not unrealistic. They point out that in the past, uh, past centuries, uh, countries developed uh, armies and navies uh, to protect, uh, first of all, for self-defense, like in places like uh, in the United States, you need an army for self-defense against uh, those who are called the merciless Indian savages who were carrying out terror against the peaceful colonists. <laughs> Chinese military experts actually use the same words to describe it. 
They describe ballistic missile defense, putting it around the corporation as not simply a shield, but an enabler of U.S. action, permits the U.S. to act freely without any concerns. More quotes. It provides, if it works, it would provide, if anyone thinks it works, it doesn't really have to, it would provide the United States with absolute freedom in using or threatening to use force in international relations, cementing U.S. hegemony, and making Americans the masters of the world. Quoting military analysts in both the liberal and the conservative press, there's not much different. That's the reasoning that lies behind the long-term geopolitical planning that was just announced in the Bush administration's national strategic document. They do represent an extreme position on the ideological spectrum, but you've got to bear in mind that it's a pretty narrow spectrum, as these pre-Bush II documents and commentary reveals, and there's a much earlier history. Well, there's plenty more to say about that topic, but I'll put it aside and turn to the more immediate question, how does the Middle East fall into this picture? Let's think about it in that general framework, which I think is the right one. The National Intelligence Council, which I was quoting, of course has a lot to say about the Middle East. They say that there will be a rising demand for energy, and they point out that that's going to undermine the Kyoto Protocols, whether anybody signs it or not, and will lead, they predict, to more rapid global warming, which is another threat to survival, but kind of rational within a lunatic framework in which planning goes on. Speaking of the Persian Gulf region, they say that's the main energy resource of the world, and it's been known to be for years. The Persian Gulf region will see large increases in oil production capacity and will rise in importance to the world energy market, so it follows that the United States has to control it, as it has done since World War II, when it kicked out France and reduced Britain to a tenant. They also point out that the United States itself is not going to rely on energy from that source. The U.S. will use more secure sources in the Atlantic Basin, meaning Latin America and West Africa, but that doesn't change anything. That's been true since probably the issue is not access to oil. It never has been. That's been true since World War II. Everybody in Texas, at least, ought to know that the United States of North America was the largest producer, the largest oil producer, right up to about 1970. It wasn't using Middle East oil. It still doesn't need it. It doesn't want it. But nevertheless, during this period, the U.S. had to control the Persian Gulf. It didn't care about the oil. It wanted to control it, and there are good reasons for that. Back in the 1940s, the State Department pointed out that Persian Gulf oil is the greatest material prize in world history and a stupendous source of strategic power. I'm going to have to explain that. Well, the greatest material prize in history means that whoever controls it gets profits beyond the dreams of avarice, to quote the standard history of the industry. And that doesn't mean just oil company profits. It also means tons of petrodollars flowing right back into the U.S. economy, propping it up. A lot of it goes to the military industry, which is a cover for high-tech industry and the Treasury securities and so on. So you've got to control it because of the profits beyond the dreams of avarice. But also, it's a stupendous source of strategic power, and that's crucial. Strategic power means it's a lever of world control. You have your hands on Persian Gulf oil. You control the world. It provides what George Kennan 50 years ago called veto power over others that might decide to get out of line. So it's not a matter of access to oil. You can have that contract. It's not a problem. It's a matter of who controls it, and the U.S. has to control this stupendous source of strategic power. Well, how do you control it? 
Rich used to run that regional primarily, and they are with um, Their internal documents are also available, so we know about their planning. This goes now back to the First World War, around the time when the world was shifting to an oil based economy. Uh, and then it was known that the Middle East was a huge tre uh, treasure. Uh, the British had a device. Uh, the idea was to uh, let the uh, country, so called countries, and so called is the right word, uh, be uh, ruled, administered by what they called an Arab facade. Uh, an Arab facade means weak, pliable, corrupt, brutal states uh, that uh, take care of local administration but have to be weak enough so the British can really run the show. And as they put it, uh, uh, British control will be veiled by constitutional fictions as a protectorate or a sphere of influence or buffer states, as we quoted in Gloria Curzon during the First World War. Uh, the, uh, this, was, this method was considered more cost effective than direct occupation, military occupation. The uh, same was true of air power. Remember, after, right after World War I, air power was sort of coming to be available as a Considered as a, for police action, That's not for wars at that time. It's a device for controlling populations, and also considered more effective than uh, direct uh, ground forces. So Winston Churchill uh, told uh, George Bush, as a bust of Churchill facing him on his desk, given to him by his lieutenant, uh, Tony Blair. Uh, <laughs> Churchill uh, was in a high position in the War the Colonial Department in those days, uh, he advised uh, use of poison gas uh, against uh, uncivilized tribes. And he uh, spoke with contempt about the squeamishness of uh, those who were raising questions about using what was then considered the most uh, criminal weapon of war. Uh, he said it would spread a lively terror among those who were chafing under British rule, uh, recalcitrant Arabs, as they were called by the high command, that referred mostly to Kurds and Afghans, incidentally. Uh, the uh, murderous bombing of civilians uh, was justified with unsafe grounds. Uh, that's the way to keep them under control. Uh, that meant that Britain had to undermine international conventions, uh, trying to restrict the use of air power against civilians. It was uh, setting uh, precedents which are followed by its uh, successor in world control. There's nothing new about what's going on now. Uh, and it was understood, again, in the sequel. So in 1932, uh, Britain succeeded in uh, undermining an uh, international convention to uh, uh, eliminate the use of air power as a terror weapon against civilians. And the distinguished uh, statesman Lloyd George, highly uh, respected, uh, wrote in his diary that this was a great achievement because, in his words, we must reserve the right to bomb niggers. Uh, that's a fundamental moral principle, and fundamental moral principles are long-lasting, uh, so it survives. you got to reserve the right to bomb niggers. Uh, <clears throat> then it was air power, uh, maybe something else, but that's necessary in the civilized world. Well, the U.S. took over the British model after the Second World War and extended it, uh, added another level of control, which is very crucial for understanding what's happening. Uh, the U.S. introduced the regional powers, which would be, as the Nixon administration called them, uh, local cops on the beat. Uh, police headquarters is in Washington, and there's a branch office in London, but the local cops on the beat are supposed to protect the Arab facade, uh, not against the Russians, against their own populations. Uh, their own populations, remember, are uh, uncivilized tribes. Uh, they can't get simple things through their heads. They don't understand why the wealth of the region of the rest to the west and a couple of uh, small groups of uh, corrupt gangsters uh, instead of being used, being used for them. You just never seem to understand that. And it's constantly, that's one of the reasons we have Reserve the right to bomb niggers. Uh, if the administration, if the local facade can't do it and the regional cops on the beat uh, aren't up to the task, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, 
local cops on the beat back then were Turkey, which has been since the Second World War, uh, Iran, uh, after the U.S. succeeded in reversing its effort to take control of its own resources, and the U.S. and Britain uh, reinstalled the Shah back in 1953. So it was a local cop, very loyal until it got out of control in 79. Uh, and the fact U.S.-Israeli relations developed in this context. That's how they developed, and that's how they remain. That's worth looking at the history. Uh, in 1948, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were quite impressed with uh, Israel's military victory, and they described Israel as uh, second only to Turkey as a military force in the region, and potentially uh, useful for U.S. power in this uh, system of regional control. Uh, ten years later, in 1958, which is a time of turmoil, I'll come back to, uh, the U.S. intelligence uh, described, uh, 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 advised that uh, uh, a uh, logical corollary, they said, of our opposition to Arab nationalism and secular nationalism, a logical corollary of our opposition to Arab nationalism is support for Israel as the one really reliable base for U.S. power in the region. That was 1958. They didn't do much about it then, it's in the back of their minds. But in 1967, uh, that was uh, demonstrated. Uh, Israel succeeded in destroying uh, one of the main, the main center of Arab nationalism, uh, Nasser's Egypt, which was also one of the centers of the hated non-aligned movement hated as an understatement, despised non-aligned movement. Uh, Egypt was one of the centers, Israel managed to destroy it. Uh, that's when the U.S.-Israel alliance really took off, and the love affair of American intellectuals with Israel took off as well, in recognition of uh, Israel's success in using violence to bomb theirs. I mean, it's put in more humanitarian terms, as intellectuals like that. But if you look at the history, that's what it was about. Uh, the, uh, uh, we should remember, side comment here, uh, that the United States is a global power, and uh, we mislead ourselves if we look too closely at one region of the world. If something's happening in one place, chances are strong it's happening in other places. That's what global powers are. That's what it means to be a global power. Uh, and uh, that was true in this case as well. So in 1967, Israel destroyed one of the centers of uh, the non-aligned movement, and as I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, uh, the uh, alliance of uh, the Indonesian army and Muslim extremists with U.S. backing destroyed another center of the non-aligned movement, namely in Indonesia, which was the second major center. The third center was India. Things were happening there too, but not much time, so I'm going to later if you like. Uh, but anyway, these two centers were destroyed. That was a great achievement. That's why there was such euphoria. Uh, and uh, that firmed up the U.S.-Israel uh, alliance. Uh, the, uh, uh, in Indonesia, let's go back a little bit, back to 1958, again, the ecological corollary was announced. Uh, 1958 happens to be an extremely important year in modern history. Uh, we now know a lot about it from classified documents and so on. The uh, Eisenhower administration in 1958 internally identified three major crises in the world. Uh, Indonesia, North Africa, and the Middle East. All oil producers, all Islam. Uh, they stressed, emphasized specifically that it had nothing to do with the Russians. The Russians weren't involved anywhere. It had to do with the usual problem indigenous nationalism. The niggers don't get the point. Uh, and you got to use force. That was the problem in the three areas. Uh, in the case of Indonesia, and the Eisenhower uh, administration acted in all of them, importantly, in Indonesia they tried to, uh, they carried out the biggest clandestine operation in post-war history. The idea was a support of revolt in Indonesia, a military revolt which would strip away the outer islands, break the country up. Uh, the outer islands are where most of the resources were. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, the U.S. then turned to supporting the military. It's the standard way to overthrow a civilian government, support the military, Chile, elsewhere, 
using words. Uh, the, and uh, that's ultimately what led to the 1965 military coup and the uh, staggering mass slaughter comparable to Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, which was greeted with uh, enormous uh, euphoria, as I mentioned, uh, for one reason, the primary reason, because it eliminated the threat of democracy. Back in 1958, there was deep concern that the party of the poor, based on the peasantry, was growing in political power. Indonesia was just too democratic, uh, and that had to be stopped, and they had to be exterminated. That was achieved in 1965, and there was no more threat, and hence the uh, uh, euphoria uh, in, in the West, uh, liberal circles, and elsewhere. Uh, that was Indonesia in 1965. One of the three crises was fixed by the coup. Uh, Israel took care of the second crisis by destroying the center of Arab nationalism. And the third one in North Africa was taken care of by itself when Algeria won independence. And then comes another story, which we won't go into. Uh, well, going back to the Middle East itself, then it's like similar things were happening at the same time in India and Latin America and elsewhere. You really have to focus on Washington if you want to understand what's going on, not on one particular region. Uh, going back to the Middle East, as I said, U.S. relations with Israel developed in this context. From the details. In 1979, those relations became still more firm when uh, Iran disappeared from the local cops uh, category on its own, being part of what's called the axis of evil, being independent. Uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, and that, the relations between Israel and Turkey, on the other hand, became much more strong, uh, all within the U.S. framework. I mentioned the strength of the Israeli uh, air and naval forces, around over 10% of them are reported now to be based permanently in Turkey. Uh, the Air Force is flying along the Iranian border, getting ready for the next war, one that comes after to take care of Iraq. And the Iranians certainly don't know it. Uh, there are also armored forces there which are necessary in Turkey in case it becomes uh, it's required once again, as in the last few years, to carry out huge atrocities against their own Kurdish populations, and of course, the atrocities of the 1990s, for which uh, Clinton bears primary responsibility to pour arms in as the atrocities mounted. And American intellectuals helped by keeping quiet about it, and don't read about it in the media, but they can easily find out. And that might be necessary again, so perhaps armored forces are necessary along with their own naval forces. Uh, this uh, uh, alliance, uh, Israel Turkey uh, alliance, Azerbaijan, a minor partner, India now joining, now that it's uh, been taken over by an extremist right wing nationalist uh, government, which is also very murderous, so it's joining into the alliance. Pakistan is kind of an uneasy partner. Uh, that's a uh, system that's evolving. Uh, these are the, looking back over the years, these are the primary reasons why the, the United States has been blocking uh, any diplomatic settlement to the Israel-Palestine conflict uh, since actually 1971. Uh, in 1971, uh, Egypt offered a full peace settlement precisely in accord with U.S. formal policy. Uh, didn't say anything about the Palestinians, just full peace in return for Israeli occupation of the Sinai, Egyptian territory. Now, that was debated in Washington, and one of Kissinger's uh, reasons we have the Nobel Prize, I guess, uh, is that he succeeded in blocking uh, He succeeded in imposing what he called stalemate. Stalemate means no negotiations, no diplomacy, just reliance on force, which they thought at that time they had total monopoly of. Ridicule the uh, Arab force. Uh, so they, looked, they uh, rejected uh, Sadat's offer, he rejected it after he kicked out Russian advisors, uh, Sadat, president of Egypt at the time. Uh, he kept warning that if uh, the U.S. continues to block peace and Israel continues to settle in the Sinai, as they were then doing in the northeastern Sinai. Uh, Sharon's contributions are very brutal. Uh, 
that if that happened, they were just going to have to resort to war. Nobody took them seriously. In 1973, they did resort to war. It turned out to be a very close thing. It came close to a nuclear war. Kissinger got the point. Clouds lifted. He then moved towards the backup strategy of accepting the Egyptian offer. That's what happened in Camp David in 1978-79. Jimmy Carter just got a Nobel Prize for having finally agreed to accept the 1971 offer after years of bloodshed and destruction. It's called a triumph of American diplomacy. In fact, a catastrophe of diplomacy, properly reinterpreted. The 1978 acceptance of Egypt's offer, the long-standing offer to have a peace treaty with Israel if Israel withdrew from the occupied, from the Sinai, from the Egyptian territories. But that was recognized right away in Israel by strategic analysts. And it's obvious if you think about it. It was recognized as a very, you know, that they didn't want to give up the Sinai, as a very important step forward. It eliminated the Arab deterrent. Egypt was the sole Arab military force that could deter anything that the United States and Israel wanted to do. And remember, when you hear that Israel's doing something, that's wrong. It's the U.S. and Israel who are doing it. Israel can't make a move without U.S. backing and authorization. So the final step. When you eliminate the Arab deterrent, as Israeli analysts pointed out at once, that frees Israel of the U.S. backing to move, to extend settlement in the occupied territories, to integrate them within Israel, and to attack their northern neighbor. Okay, they're now free to do it with no deterrent. That's exactly what happened. The first invasion of Lebanon was in 1978, in the middle of Camp David. The big invasion, the Sharon invasion, was 1982. Killed about 20,000 people. There was no pretext, even, of self-defense. Nobody talked about it. The purpose, to quote the chief of staff, Kouli Khan, was to destroy the PLO as a candidate for negotiations with us about the land of Israel. The land of Israel means the occupied territories. The purpose was to undermine the possibility of diplomatic moves, which the PLO was annoyingly putting forward. And the way to do that was to invade Lebanon and destroy them. 20,000 corpses, a real triumph for Sharon and Reagan. The Reagan was the guys in Washington now, the same ones, who authorized it, supported it, and beat the Security Council resolutions to block it, and so on. Notice that that's a textbook illustration of international terrorism, if not outright aggression, which is a much worse frame. Well, going back a little, in 1976, the United States became more isolated in the diplomatic arena. The Security Council debated a resolution calling for what has been, ever since then, a very broad international consensus on settling the problem, namely a two-state settlement on the international border, maybe minor modifications. It was supported by virtually the whole world, supported strongly by the Arab states, by the Palestinians. Israel opposed it. They reacted by refusing to attend the UN session, instead bombing Lebanon, killing about 50 people. It was reported, no pretext. It was reported, but it's not terrorism. It's our allies. It's just something that happened. The US reacted by vetoing the resolution. It was vetoed again in 1980, the same one. Notice that a US veto is, in fact, a double veto. It's important to realize that. First of all, it blocks the action, but it also wipes it out of history. So it doesn't exist in history. You try to read about it, it didn't happen. That's rather important. There's a lot of talk now about violation of UN resolutions. Iraq, you know, violates all kinds of UN resolutions. I mean, if Iraq had veto power, it wouldn't be in violation of any law. If you really want to talk about violation of resolutions, you'd have to look at the veto. That's the best way to violate a UN resolution. You just block it. And it gives the United States to wipe it out of history, too. So if we're serious and talk about violating resolutions, we should be looking at the record of the vetoes. 
And that's very straightforward. There's nothing controversial about it. Uh, since the UN, since decolonization, when the UN became more representative of world opinion, and since the reconstruction of, from the destruction of the Second World War, roughly since the 1960s, uh, the U.S. is far in the lead in vetoing Security Council resolutions on a whole variety of topics and you know, all sorts of things. Uh, in second place is Britain, and nobody else is even within shouting distance. Uh, so that's the main violation of UN resolutions. Uh, there's some talk about Israel's violations, which is true, but minor in comparison. And beside the Israeli violations are really the U.S. violations again. Uh, this, uh, uh, all of this is, of course, suppressed or denied in public commentary, but as I say, the facts are absolutely straightforward. There's nothing controversial about them. And it continues right to the present. So this year, uh, there's been talk uh, about what's called the Saudi Plan, uh, uh, ratified by the Arab states last March. Uh, the Saudi Plan is nothing new. It's a reiteration of the uh, Saudi plan of 1981, which was blocked by the Reagan administration, as you would suppose. And that itself was just a reiteration of the 1976 uh, Security Council resolution that the U.S. vetoed. And in fact, in one form or another, it's the same plan that's you know, all over the place. A two state settlement on the international border, maybe minor rectifications here and there. Uh, it's an overwhelming international consensus, has been for a long time. It actually happens to be supported by the U.S. public. So if you look at the polls, about two-thirds of the population supports what they call the Saudi plan. Uh, roughly the same proportion of the population thinks the United States ought to be more involved in the diplomacy of the Middle East. Now, people don't know that that's a self-contradiction. Uh, if the, it's precisely U.S. involvement that has prevented this plan from being implemented for 25 years. But you can't know that unless you carry out an independent research project or unless you're part of a you know, Palestine solidarity organization or some other uh, activist group. If you somehow manage to get around the doctrinal system in the schools and the universities and the media and so on, then you can know that it's a contradiction. But most people don't have that luxury. Uh, one of the tasks of organizing is to give them that luxury. Uh, and that's a plan which has been on the table for 25 years, still is, supported by the majority of the population here as elsewhere, and it could be implemented. Uh, well, Clinton uh, made some moves on that. He uh, rescinded uh, international law and uh, UN resolutions. Uh, his administration declared them to be, at the UN, uh, obsolete and anachronistic. Uh, then comes the Oslo, what's called here the Oslo Peace Process, which changed the modalities, uh, but maintained the concepts. And we know what the concepts were, so let's go to the Dovish side. Uh, Ehud Barak, who was the, you know, Camp David, who was the supposedly Dovish negotiator, you know, right next to Bill Clinton, two peacemakers. Uh, his uh, chief negotiator uh, was Shlomo ben Ami. Considered a dove in the Israeli spectrum, he's an academic historian. And just before he uh, joined the Barak government, ended up being foreign minister, he wrote a book in Hebrew in 1998, in which he discussed the Oslo process. And he pointed out quite accurately that the goal of the Oslo process is to establish a neo colonial dependency for Palestinians in the occupied territories, which would be permanent. Case of a permanent neo colonial dependence. Very similar to Sharon, that's the Dutch side, Barack and Clinton. And that indeed, if you look at the record of the Oslo peace process, that's exactly what it was. It was a careful, calculated effort with US support, which can't happen otherwise. Uh, in fact, payments, so you're paying for it, uh, to establish a permanent neo colonial dependence. Now, there's a spectrum there too, just like there is here. So a, a high official in the Foreign Office recently, a person, uh, now Vice President of Tel Aviv University, uh, recently wrote an article on Sharon's strategy in which he pointed out that uh, the security uh, analysts uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s were looking uh, for a model 
for the occupied territories. They were looking at South Africa as a model. That's uh, not a big insight, but it's nice to have it sit from on high. Uh, South Africa, back in the early 1960s, established uh, what they called independent states, black-run states, black leadership, you know, black armies, uh, we're called here in Afghanistan. And uh, they're at least as viable as the neo colonial dependency planned by Clinton and uh, uh, Barack for the Palestinians. Uh, and that's what the Israeli security establishment was looking at in the 70s and the 80s more brightly, and then what they began to implement in the U.S. help of the uh, Oslo process. Well, uh, here at the Camp David uh, proposals, you know, Clinton Barak proposals were you know, a lot of gushing about how magnanimous they were, and generous, and fantastic, uh, and uh, terrible Palestinians wouldn't accept them. Uh, there's a very easy way to test that, extremely easy way. Just look at a map. Now look at a map which draws the boundaries that were, uh, that were proposed. You can find those maps. They're in the Israeli press. They're in the dissident literature here. They're in the standard scholarly sources. But there's one place where they're missing, the U.S. press. I have not found a single case of a map in the U.S. press nobody's been able to find that draws the boundaries, which you can find, you can find it here too, is maps that give, you know, mention where the settlements are. But then you got to use your imagination, you got to think it through. You have to say, well, okay, if that's where the settlements are, where are the boundaries? Uh, if somebody bothered to draw the boundaries, you'd see exactly how magnanimous the plan was. It broke up the West Bank into four separated cantons, virtually separated a, what they said, said in going east to Jerusalem, including a town called Malad Amim, which was established basically to bisect the West Bank with a big infrastructure development, roads and stuff linking into the vastly expanded area of Jerusalem that bisects the West Bank. There's another state to the north which bisects it again. Uh, that's three, all separated from a little part of East Jerusalem. Uh, which was the center of Palestinian commercial and uh, life and communication. So that's the West Bank, it all separated from the U.S. That's the magnanimous proposal. And it's quite understandable that maps didn't appear. But as soon as you see a map, you know exactly how magnanimous it was. Kind of impressive, but the media and the journals of opinion and so on could be so subordinate to power that nobody broke ranks. I mean, it's not that anyone's telling them, like the government's not ordering them to shut up, and they didn't have to do it if they were ordered. And nobody's telling them, it's just uh, uh, internalized self-censorship. There's some things you just wouldn't do for people to know, like how magnanimous this uh, offer is that we're praising. Uh, after having said that, I should say that Clinton and Barack did uh, advance uh, towards uh, a neo-colonial dependence. Uh, at the time of Camp David, in the West Bank, Palestinians were divided into about uh, over 200 tiny little areas, uh, some a couple of square kilometers. And Clinton and Barack did make progress. They reduced it to four cantons in the West Bank. So that's praise for that. Uh, and uh, as I say, understandable uh, that there's no maps and interpret the discussion as you like. Uh, under the cover of the Oslo neocolonial process, uh, the U.S. and Israel continued to uh, uh, institute uh, the, this plan, or the clear plan, uh, incorporate the useful part of the territories, and of course the resources within Israel, uh, population, settler population, roughly double. Uh, the worst year was the last year, the last plan in Iraq year. It was the highest year of new settlements, uh, highest since before Oslo, and they were planning more in the budget for the following year, Sharon escalated a bit. Uh, after Camp David, there was a sign of hope in January 2001, there was an informal, the meetings went on after Camp David, lots of discussions went on. And in January 2001, months later, uh, there was a meeting, an informal meeting in Tabo of high-level representatives of uh, Israel and the Palestinians, and they actually did move it forward. Uh, we have a lot of details.
details about the Taliban negotiations from both sides, and it was a better proposal. Maybe it was even the basis for something that might have worked out. Still had the salience, but they were reduced other possibilities. We don't know where that would have gone. The meetings were called off by Israel, and so we don't know. And it just goes back to the violence. But it was a possibility, and it could be a basis for a proceeding. But of course, for it to proceed, there's got to be an organized Palestinian leadership, and the following months that was simply dismantled by violence. The point of the activities the last year has been to dismantle any functioning Palestinian leadership and undermine that possibility. But of course, it's never forever. We can change it here if we like. The Bush administration carried this long-term projections program forward. I lost track of time. How am I doing on time? Well, the Bush administration pushed all this forward. The good indication of it is the fate of the Geneva Conventions. They're very important. The Geneva Conventions were, as you know, instituted right after the Second World War. They're the core of international humanitarian law. The point was to criminalize formally the actions of the Nazis. The Fourth Convention has to do with what the Nazis did in occupied territories. And the Fourth Convention is what applies to the Israeli-occupied territories, what are called here the disputed territories, but they're not disputed. If the Geneva Conventions were applied, just about everything the U.S. and Israel are doing and have done in the occupied territories would be criminal, actually war crimes under U.S. law, and that would be the basis for a settlement of the kind that the world has wanted for a long time. So the Geneva Conventions are quite important. Actually, the U.S. officially recognized that the conventions apply to the occupied territories, or to put it differently, it has never withdrawn its official recognition of that. That was, for example, stressed by George Bush No. 1 30 years ago when he was U.N. ambassador, and in that role it condemned Israeli violations of the Geneva Conventions in the occupied territories as the occupying power. There were no pretenses then. In 1980, the Security Council unanimously, including the U.S., condemned Israel for what are called flagrant violations of the Geneva Conventions. That included the settlement which the U.S. was funding, so it was a totally hypocritical vote to condemn it because it was funding it, but acting involuntarily. That was repeated in 1991, again unanimous, the Bush administration joined. In October 2000, that's the most recent time it came to the Security Council, there was a unanimous endorsement once again of that condemnation of the violations of the Geneva Conventions and orders to terminate them. At that time, Clinton abstained in veto, presuming he didn't want to veto a core element of international humanitarian law, particularly considering the circumstances under which it was enacted in the late 40s. So the U.S. abstained, which is formally, it means nothing, it means it was unanimously passed, so it is international law, but in practice means it's vetoed, so it's vetoed from history, you don't read about it. Bush carried it further. Last December, there was a, Switzerland, which is responsible for the Geneva Conventions, called a meeting of the high contracting parties, signers of the convention, who are legally obligated to implement, to consider, once again, the application of the conventions to the occupied territories. That meeting, almost everyone attended, all the European Union, even our lieutenant in London showed up, and there was a statement that concluded that Israel, meaning the U.S. and Israel, I don't want to say U.S., was guilty of grave breaches of the conventions. They explained what they were, the settlement policies which the U.S. funds, 
willful killings, torture, unlawful deportation, deprivation of the right of fair trial, destruction and appropriation of property, and so on. The U.S. has said boycotted it. That kills it, the usual double veto of accordion history. And a major contribution to what Bush calls enhancing the terror when something happens done by people who don't like it. This was a contribution to it. A week later, the Bush administration made another contribution to enhancing the terror. On December 14th, it once again vetoed a Security Council resolution initiated by the Europeans in this case, calling for a dispatch of international monitors to the occupied territories. It's the best way to reduce the level of violence, as everyone knows. So that was vetoed again. A couple of months after that, Bush presented the official word of man of peace to Ariel Sharon. It's like they shocked Israelis who were very familiar with the 50-year record of horrible terrorism, but now he's officially a man of peace. And in fact, by now, the U.S. has made it very clear that it strongly supports and is closely linked to the most extremist elements within the Israeli spectrum. It's much to the joy of the Israeli right wing, I should say, and its U.S. supporters, who happen to have enormous influence in the current administration. People like Richard Pearl are writing position papers for Benjamin Netanyahu, who's to the right of Sharon, just five years ago. And those are interesting papers. Well, the Israeli press, which is pretty reliable on these things, I should say, especially the Hebrew press, they report now that Washington is informing Israeli leaders about plans for radical reconstruction of the whole Middle East. I mean, here it's called the Democracy Security Op-Ed. It's in the New York Times. They don't have to talk about that when they're talking to each other. No sane person believes it. That's scams for intellectuals. What they're telling them is that they want to reconstruct the Middle East region with quite ambitious plans. So, for example, one of the plans that's afoot, how seriously, I don't know, is to restore at least part of Iraq to a Hashemite kingdom, which is right under the thumb of the United States, maybe to extend that. It means Jordan. To extend it maybe to parts of Saudi Arabia. Probably would mean that Turkey takes over the northern part, where much of the oil is. But all the U.S. control on to Iran. There are already plans afoot, basically, to partition Iran. There are plans for Saudi Arabia. And, in fact, according to both the Israeli and international press, good sources, they're thinking about going on much farther, as far as China and so on. They feel that they have an enormous preponderance of power, that nobody can stand in their way, and they can do anything they want. And they're basically right, except for reactions here. It's the only place that can be stopped. Well, the Ehud Shrinsat, who's one of the leading Israeli commentators, he just came back from a meeting with Pentagon officials, Rumsfeld and Pearl and those guys, and he informed the press that we are talking about a revolutionary group. One can summarize their approach in one sentence. They think that Arabs are retards who understand only the language of force. Actually, that's an understatement. That's the way they think about the world. You can see that in the reaction to what happened in Germany a couple of weeks ago. They are retards, too, because they don't understand that you follow American orders and shut up. The Security Council was just informed a couple of days ago by a high administration official. He defined relevance for them. He said the Security Council is relevant if it gives the United States government in Washington the authorization that Congress gave them. Otherwise, they're irrelevant. They have a choice as to whether to be relevant or not. So the world is a bunch of retards who understand nothing but the language of force, and the guys in Washington understand very well that they have an overwhelming preponderance of it, and they also know very well that the only restriction on it is domestic. Now we're back to ourselves. We're a free country. We can do a lot of things about that, and nobody else much can. The next step is the invasion of Iraq, probably over the winter. 
Now, there's a reason for that, too. Uh, anybody who's you know, a planner in the Bush administration and is thinking about the next presidential election, uh, does, uh, the, the war sort of has to be over the winter. It's the best time to carry out war in that area. So it's either this winter or next winter, but next winter's too late. That's in the middle of the presidential campaign. Uh, you don't want people, by the time the presidential campaign comes, you want people to be thinking about the next monster who's going to destroy us and praising the leader who saved us from this awesome threat of destruction, uh, which nobody seems to care about in the region, like Kuwait and Iran. I mean, they're terrified, but they're terrified of the United States, not of Iraq. Uh, but uh, somehow we perceive it and everybody's frightened. He's a terrible guy. Is a special form of international economic integration 
uh, design in order to benefit investors and lenders and major corporations and so on with the interest of the world's population, you know, not even secondary, somewhere way behind. Uh, and they don't care. They know that programs are retard economic development and growth and so on. That's fine. They do concentrate wealth and power. Uh, uh, what you can do about these is stop them. I mean, most of them, and it's not just the United States, of course, it's, a, it's implemented by a combination of uh, networks of international corporations, uh, the G7, the big seven rich countries, the U.S. overwhelmingly important among them, uh, the international institutions they have, primarily the IMF, which is kind of an offshoot of the U.S. Treasury, uh, and uh, that's a reason why this is called the Washington Consensus. I mean, it comes straight out of Washington. But that's a good thing for us. Coming straight out of Washington means we're changing. Uh, it is very much in our hands. The system of power is very fragile, and they know it. Uh, and that's why they continually try to terrify everybody so they won't pay attention. Uh, and there are counter forces. Uh, these uh, internet, what's called the anti globalization movement, which is just another term of propaganda against globalization. Uh, the uh, global justice movements are looking for a different form of globalization, one that cares about people, not just uh, the profits. And that's a powerful movement. It has been nothing like it in history. It's international. It draws from all possible walks of life. It's, uh, it's something completely new, very positive, and you know, plenty of people here are directly involved in it. I had a chance to listen to some of them yesterday, and it's impressive. So you can find it right here in Austin and everywhere else. Uh, and you know, they, have, they can change globalization to something humane and decent and helpful to people. As far as homeland security is concerned, now we have to go back to this very special use of the term terror, technical use, which means terror against us. And it does exist. Uh, it's not a joke. It's been known for a long time. It didn't start on September 11th. I mean, so I can remember that. Uh, in 1993, related groups uh, practically blew up the World Trade Center. Uh, the conclusion of analysts at the time was that if they had had better planning, they would have blown up the World Trade Center, killing tens of thousands of people. And they had much more ambitious plans. They were going to blow up the UN, the FBI building, the tunnels on the river, and so on. Well, they were caught just in time, but nobody, certainly nobody in intelligence, in fact, no reader of the newspapers, they should have had any doubt that uh, uh, there are, it's possible with contemporary technology to carry out uh, major terrorist attacks against the rich and powerful for the first time. Uh, up until then, it was a uh, monopoly of the wealthy and the powerful. Now it's still an enormous preponderance, but it's not a monopoly. There have been technical papers and books in the literature for years about this, practically uh, guidebooks to terrorists. So yeah, it, it's a problem that exists in the whole spectrum of international terrorism. It's small, but that's not to say it's not existing. I mean, what happened on September 11th was a horrible atrocity, and what almost happened on, in 1993 would have been a much worse atrocity, except it was just barely stopped. And there will probably be more. And as I said, there's a way to increase it. The CIA just told us how to increase the threat, namely by invading Iraq. Uh, that's a good way to increase the threat. Uh, the uh, CIA also told us just a couple of days ago that in, in the, in the uh, that uh, the bombing of Afghanistan had nothing to do with it, uh, that the threat is exactly what it was before that. There have been successes in breaking up these networks, but they're taking places in places like Germany through police work, there, which is the way to deal with criminal actions and manage to dismantle a number of serious cells. Uh, but there's no real concern about that here. All right, getting back to Homeland Security. Uh, I mean, I don't object to going, you know, taking my shoes off at the airport. Okay, I mean, I think it's a waste of time, but okay. They've never stopped anything that way, and I doubt they ever will. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, it's okay. I mean, it's not a big problem. Uh, on the other hand, when it goes on to uh, what, the, what John Ashcroft would really like, you know, kind of proto-fascism, yeah, that means a problem. Uh, but we can stop that too. I mean, what's already going on is pretty uh, outrageous. So, for example, in Guantanamo, every, every principle, known or unknown principle of international
international humanitarian law is being radically violated. Thank you very much. First of all, Guantanamo is even less of a U.S. possession than Texas is. Texas is a result of conquest of the civil service. Guantanamo is only the right of, there by the right of conquest, it's called the liberation of Cuba, which was in fact the prevention of Cuba's liberation from Spain, left Cuba as a kind of a U.S. colony, until Castro and they held on to Guantanamo. But sending people there without charge, permanently, no right to counsel, the only crime known is that they were living in caves while they were being bombed by the biggest bombing attack in history. I mean, that is so outrageous, you can't even discuss it. It's a violation of everything you can imagine. And the treatment of immigrants here is nothing to cheer about. And vulnerable populations in general are getting in the neck. And that should not be allowed, it's a big issue here. But nevertheless, you don't have to agree to having it either go on or to be extended to more privileged sectors of the population. But those are choices. So, you know, if there's some security precautions, okay, there should be. But the main way to stop terrorism is to take a look at Crawford and Washington, and certainly not to allow the Ashcroft-style controls to be implemented or go on. You talk about the importance of activism in protecting Cuba, both domestically and globally. I'm giving you comments on intellectualism, and maybe my definition of intellectualism is different from yours. What's the impact of the formal educational process in America on effecting change? Well, I like to quote, so let me quote some liberal sectors of international opinion. After the 1960s, we saw a lot of ferment and activism and democratic initiatives and public participation and so on. I mean, those are the roots of the feminist movement and the environmental movement and the solidarity movement, some things that have really changed the society enormously. And it caused enormous fear and concern among educated sectors. And in fact, there's a major book on it, which you should read if you haven't done so yet, called The Crisis of Democracy, which was published by the Trilateral Commission in 1974, I guess. Trilateral because it's the three centers of industrial democracy, Europe, the United States, and Canada. And it draws from the liberal extreme. These are, for example, the whole Carter administration was drawn from that. It gives you an indication of where they're coming from, the same in Europe and Japan. So this is kind of a liberal internationalist wing of opinion. And they were very, the crisis of democracy that they were talking about was the fact that there had been an upsurge of democracy in the 1960s. People who were usually apathetic and passive and follow orders the way they're supposed to do, suddenly, through activism, started entering the political arena and pressing their own interests and concerns. Young people, old people, women, men, all of what are called special interests, speaking of everybody. But they started trying to do something about their own interests. And that's a crisis of democracy. Like if you study eighth grade civics, they tell you it's democracy. But if you're sophisticated, you know it's a crisis of democracy. It has to be stopped. People have to be returned to apathy and obedience and passivity. And as the American rapporteur said, and maybe we can even get back to the good old days when Truman was able to govern the country with the help of a few Wall Street lawyers and financiers. Well, that's kind of an exaggeration, but he kind of captured a number of political scientists at Harvard. That's the kind of model. So we have to overcome the crisis of democracy. Let's get back to the educational institutions. One of the things they were concerned about was the failure of what they call, they call, the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. That includes the schools, the universities, the churches, and so on. They weren't doing their job, the job of indoctrination of the young. They weren't properly training people to be passive. And that's the crisis of democracy. Thank you. 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 Thank you
passive, obedient, submissive, uh, paying attention to your own private concerns and letting the smart guys run the world without any trouble. And therefore, these institutions had to do a better job of indoctrinating the young. Okay? That's the liberal wing. The right wing is harsher. Uh, the, uh, and that's been going on for the last 30 years, trying to restore discipline to the institutions. And it hasn't worked. It's been trying, this has gone on in the past. It's not the first such time. This time is unusual and it hasn't worked. Uh, the popular movements have grown and expanded, and the uh, crisis of democracy has gotten greater, and all sorts of means have been used to try to control them. And they've sort of partially worked, but to a large extent, they've not worked. I mean, think about it. The major popular movements that have really changed the culture and the society, and they really have. They've raised the level of civilization significantly. Those are products of the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. I mentioned a couple feminist movements, the 70s, the environmental movement began then, the anti-nuclear movements, the solidarity movements, the global justice movements that I mentioned are uh, recent. I mean, actually, they're old. But in the third world, they've been going on for decades. But the, the West began to join them in the last couple of years, and that's important. Uh, and, you know, these are, it's been hard to repress. And, uh, well, it's fair to say, it's over talking to people in East Austin yesterday and saw some impressive ways in which it's not only not repressed, but it's expanded. It's hard to control people. And, uh, the institutions, the indoctrination institutions themselves have changed. Uh, I don't like what goes on in the media and the universities, and it's a lot better than it was uh, 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, in all sorts of ways. Uh, I'm just give you one personal example, but it's illustrative of changes. Uh, I, I have to live in a professional, you know, upper middle class suburb of Boston, educated people, very progressive, you know, put the right way on everything and so on. Uh, the, uh, I'm not unless it's on letting blacks into Lexington. But uh, the, uh, uh, my daughter who was in uh, fourth grade back in 1969, and uh, totally good. Progressive type of school. I was looking through her textbook one day uh, and she had a textbook on uh, colonial New England. And uh, it was sort of a description. So the, the structure is this boy, his name's Robert, he's being told about the wonders of colonial New England by an older man. I, I was wondering how they're going to handle the big massacres. You know, like the Pequot massacre, the first big massacre. In New England, when the colonists waited until the merciless Indian savages left the village, and then they went in and murdered all the women and children and old people. Uh, so how are they going to handle it? Well, it turned out that they told the story accurately. They described it just the way it did, but with praise. Uh, in fact, the boy who's being told all this says, uh, I wish I were a man and had been there. So I could have done it too. It happens that this was right after the Nevada massacre had been exposed. Showed up my wife. Outraged, of course, went in and talked to the teacher. Asked, you know, told the sort of teacher to pass the teacher in our understand what the problem was. It seemed like the words misspelled.
Homeland Security, we have the army, that sort of thing. Uh, and also it gets rid of uh, what's called in the criminology literature the uh, dangerous classes. Uh, it's, uh, you take a look at the history of prohibition all the way back you know, centuries. So you almost always targets uh, people who are considered a problem domestically because they're poor or they're, you know, immigrants or something or other. Uh, so like, uh, you know, take say marijuana. Why was marijuana picked as the drug of choice to criminalize? Well, first of all, they needed something after prohibition ended. You know, you got this big federal bureaucracy and you can't go after prohibitions. They needed something. But why marijuana? Well, marijuana was used by Mexicans and by blacks. Okay. So therefore, let's go after marijuana. You know, they medical evidence. In fact, they still don't have any medical evidence. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's what you go after. Actually, if you take a look at marijuana use, I mean, it peaked in the late 70s, but criminalization was very low because the people who are using it are folks like you. Vietnam. 
they had to resort to what's called clandestine warfare, meaning everybody in the world knows about it except the American population. <laughs> Commonplace. 
among working people all over the United States in the, in the 19th century. In fact, it was even a slogan of the Republican Party. The slogan of the Republican Party was that there's no main big difference between wage labor, labor and slavery. And we sort of had that beat out of it. Tariff. 
I mean, they still have an overwhelming preponderance, but they don't have a monopoly. Uh, and now there are terrorist groups around the world which uh, are breaking that monopoly, and pretty seriously. What I described in 1993 wasn't a joke, and what actually happened in September 11th, uh, not as bad as what it looked like in 93, was bad enough. And there's going to be more. And as I said, there are ways to do this. But there's no, no such thing as containment, there's nothing to do with it. You want to stop the terror, you listen to the experts who I was quoting. They all understand how to talk. Stop it. You reduce the grievances. I mean, let's, let's take a smaller case. Take, say, IRA terror in London. I mean, one way to react to it would have been, say, uh, to send the RAF to bomb Boston. Okay. I mean, that was the center of finance. So why not bomb Boston? Uh, and what about it? tried to repress it by force, it just got worse. And finally got into their heads. They better pay some attention to the grievances, which are a lot of legitimate. It's not to say that the bomb in London was legitimate. It's not it's a criminal act. You deal with it like a criminal act. But it comes out of real grievances. Uh, like the kinds that I was quoting. You don't deal with the grievances, can I have more? So yeah, you want to stop the
I would like to know what you think about that. I can take this into consideration. Cultural and political deficiencies exist in many countries in the world. And much of this goes back hundreds of years. How much cultural and political deficiencies? Deficiencies, yes. Yeah. Uh, how much of a role do you think this plays into creating terrorism? Well, there certainly are cultural and political deficiencies. In fact, I mentioned some. So when my daughter in fourth grade and
to a love education. <laughs> but um, the thing was, after the fall of the Shah, it's arguable that the actual education rates have been doubled ever since you know, that Khomeini, etc. So what was your view on it? Well, first of all, just on the phrase acts of evil, uh, it's not, this isn't the <coughs> country where it's used. So, for example, the Egyptian press has also used the phrase axis of evil, referring to the United States, Turkey, and Israel. Uh, and that's, a, that's a much more sensible usage. Uh, there's plenty of evil to go around, and they are an actual axis. There's no other axis. <laughs> Uh, the Iranians figured it out. They 
caught the people involved, and they executed him around 1964. And then comes another phase, you know, the Oliver North phase, with uh, General Robert McFarlane uh, going through the streets of Tehran, reading the Bibles and that kind of stuff. Uh, and it was by then tied into the U.S. war in Nicaragua. And now that's called uh, arms for hostages. But can't be that. There were no hostages in the early 80s. And in fact, the first hostages happened to be Iran in, in Lebanon. Uh, but that was a nice cover for it. Uh, but in fact, it's just the standard way to kind of throw a government. I didn't work. Uh, meanwhile, Iran went its own way. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, if the U.S. corporations would want to get back into Iran, you know, they don't want it to be. They don't want to be edged out by their European rivals. Uh, they're in favor of building pipelines through Iran, which is the easiest way to do it. The U.S. government won't allow it. I mean, there are reformist movements in Iran, which we can be happy to link up to the United States, but the government here won't allow it. Uh, because, and in fact, they're even overruling, apparently, their own energy corporations, which is kind of unusual. And there's a reason for that. I think there's a reason for that. Uh, this is a country, it's kind of like what I said about Cuba. Uh, you cannot allow people to get away with successful defiance of the United States. The enforcement doesn't allow that. And people have to understand that successful defiance is going to lead to punishment. The Cubans were actually a rather similar example. There have been 40 years of terror and economic strangulation, which even the U.S. business community is in favor of. But it goes on. Uh, because of successful defiance, as kind of you guys put it, which cannot be tolerated. You want to run the world, people have to understand that you follow orders. That's why they bombed Serbia. You take a look at the actual reasons given, actual reasons, both at the time and in retrospect. The only one that made any sense that they keep to is what they call the credibility, keeping the credibility of NATO. I mean, that's Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, and everyone else. Uh, when they talk about the credibility of NATO, they are not talking about Belgium and Italy. They're talking about the credibility of the United States and its tactical Britain. Their credibility is what's important. And credibility means you're scared out of your wits and you know you don't cross the mask. It's a, you want to figure it out, ask uh, you know, the neighborhood mafia gun. I mean, if somebody doesn't pay protection money, the Don does not go and get a court order to get the money. <laughs> they could get the court today. And the same reason the U.S. doesn't go to the Security Council to get authorization. If you're the Don, uh, you teach the guy a lesson so that others understand that you don't get out of line. And that need for credibility, as it's called, it's called that in international relations literature. Maintaining credibility. Uh, that often overrule, overrides even economic motivation. In fact, you know, we don't have documents, but I suspect that, but I suspect that that's primarily what's going on with regard to Iran. They have to be taught a lesson, and everybody else does too. Uh, and the lesson is, uh, you know, you know, you don't disobey the time. <laughs> Germany and uh, you know, 
United Arab Republics. Okay, so if without knowing it's just for us to bomb Afghanistan, then after 40 years of terror, why isn't it just for Cuba to bomb Washington? And why isn't it just for Nicaragua to bomb Washington and New York uh, after the U.S. nominee carried out a major terrorist war against them uh, that was even ordered by the World Court to terminate its international terrorism and then went on to escalate it? And we can go on and on. I mean, if extradition is an issue, you know, the U.S. didn't ask Afghanistan to extradite Osama bin Laden. I mean, they made, the Taliban made some moves in that direction. The U.S. just buffed it. They didn't want to hear about it because the Don doesn't play games with laws. Uh, they told the Afghans, just turn them over if we say so, and we're not going to provide you with any evidence. Okay, right at that same moment, uh, like September, September 30th, 2001, uh, Haiti renewed, not for the first time, renewed his request to the U.S. government for extradition through official channels of a nice guy named Emmanuel Constant, who was the head of the paramilitary forces uh, that killed about four or 5,000 patients very brutally in the early 90s with the support of George Bush number one and Bill Clinton. Uh, there's no question of his guilt. He was sentenced to an abstention. He doesn't deny it, nor does the U.S. government. Uh, did the U.S. extradite him? They didn't, they didn't answer. They didn't respond. Okay, he's been killed. He's possibly for killing four or five thousand black people. It's a way to deal with the niggers, remember? Uh, and uh, so they didn't respond to the request. Uh, uh, I mean, so the paper, the press didn't bother mentioning it. Uh, so is Haiti entitled to uh, this caliber? <laughs> Haiti is entitled to set off terrorist bombs all over the United States. I mean, if the rules of the game are supposed to be fair, why not? In fact, if you look at all the literature, there's a ton of literature, just like this, it's unfair to pick him out. There's a ton of literature on how bombing Afghanistan is a just war of self-defense. It's simply applied to that literature, all of it, 100%, the test of fair game and see if there is anything in it that begins to meet that minimal condition. Try it. I think you'll find that nothing does. And it's all a pop junk and pure hypocrisy. And no one can possibly do it.
I mean, there are such cases, and they're real. Uh, like, so for example, take Hillary Bill's program, something we know about, because you know, the documents came out under the court order. It was a very, if you don't know about it, you should. It's the most serious attack on civil liberties in the United States in its history. This was a campaign that went on through four administrations, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. I was finally exposed uh, in, during the Nixon years, but in, not in the press or anything like that, exposed by courts, you know, lawyers. And it was a major campaign to try to undermine <coughs> political, any kind of political dissent in the United States. I mean, it started with the Communist Party and it went to the American Indian Movement, the Puerto Rican Movement, and the Black Movements, and the New Left, and the Women's Movement. And finally, it was everybody. And that did get us, that was pretty serious. Uh, that went as far as political assassination. It did. It's the one case we know of that went to political assassination. But that was a black organizer. That was Fred Hand. A black organizer in Chicago was set up by the FBI and assassinated by the Chicago police in a setup. Uh, when a Gestapo style assassination, you know, break into the apartment at 4 o'clock in the morning and murder you know, some Mark Clark in bed, maybe drugged. Uh, all of the FBI so Okay, that's real. But that's a black organizer. Okay. Those are, that's spawning the niggers again. So it's not a big deal. It was never considered an issue during the Watergate hearings, for instance. Uh, Watergate is about trivialities, real trivialities. But things like assassinating a, a black organizer, that wasn't a crime. Because it isn't a crime. It's just a normal operating procedure. And if you open the doors on that, you don't go after Nixon, you go after everybody, because it goes way back. Uh, so, so, but, but, it was, but it's unusual. It's not the way this country works. So I don't think there are, you know, the least, I mean, there are plenty of places in the world where you have to worry about assassination. It's like in Colombia, like my counterparts in Colombia, where I just was. They have, they have to worry about assassination, uh, but we don't. talking today about the U.S. efforts to basically take over the world. And throughout history, various governments have tried to take over the world. But there are other countries who might have, but they never tried. And my question is, what are the basic forces and patterns in the culture that lead that in fundamental human nature that drive empire-building behavior? I don't think there's anything special in human nature. I mean, there, um, take a look at human history. There are thousands of years where people you know, tend their farms and don't try to murder each other and so on and so forth. I mean, human nature allows all sorts of things. Uh, under specific circumstances and conditions and institutional structures, you know, you're going to get aggressive and violent behavior. Not just in your many other places, but the answer to that is not in human nature, it's in uh, getting rid of those circumstances and institutions. So other aspects of human nature can flourish, as has happened throughout history. I'm mean, the uh, and right now, I mean, the large the population now is much more opposed to aggression and violence than it was 40 years ago, much more. I'll give some examples, and there's a lot more. And it's the same genes, it's just uh, different. Like, you know, a lot of cultural defects have been overcome. Uh, and, uh, plenty more to go. Uh, what's driving it? Well, you know, it's not always the same thing. <coughs> the Roman Empire wasn't driven by the same goals as, uh, uh, you know, George, uh, Richard Pearl and Paul Wolfowitz. But uh, if you check back, you can find it. It's not very profound. I mean, the U.S. takes the United States. Uh, the, the U.S. Is, was never intended to be a democracy. I mean, Madison didn't have a democracy in mind. Uh, he read the Constitutional Convention and the debates. Uh, he wanted the U.S. to be what political scientists now call a polyarchy, not a democracy. That is a country where, in Madison's words, power is in the hands of the wealth of the nation. Uh, men who are sympathetic to the rights of property owners. 
and you want to keep the public marginalized and fragmented so they don't get in the way. And he had good reasons for it, a smart guy. And the country was set up that way. I mean, Madison used the, of course, used the example of England as a model. So in the debates in the Constitutional Convention, he you know, tried, to, tried to bring out to people how dangerous democracy would be. He said, suppose in England, uh, people actually had uh, the right to make decisions you know, through the electoral system. Uh, the first thing they would do is dispossess property owners. Um, that is, they'd carry out what we nowadays call agrarian reform. And we can't allow that, that's an atrocity. Uh, so therefore, you have to make sure that power is in the hands of the wealth of the nation, people who understand what he called the permanent interests of the nation. And the permanent interests he defined, it's, I'm quoting it, to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. Okay. And in order to do that, uh, you have to have power concentrated among the wealthy, and you have to have the population fragmented, and so on and so forth. And that's the way the system was set up. Okay. Well, you know, there were battles about that over the centuries, and it goes up and back, and so on. Uh, but uh, still the driving idea. Uh, what I was quoting from the crisis of democracy is uh, concern about the fact that it might become a democracy. And the, uh, and the roots of, I mean, everything changed seriously about a century ago you know, with the, what's called the corporatization of America, when new kinds of entities were established, corporate entities, which are what are called you know, legal literature, collectivist fictions, legal collectivist fictions, uh, which are designed to concentrate, it was designed primarily to overcome terrible market failures and to institute some kind of command economy, but not in the hands of the state, in the hands of private power. And these entities, which are, as I said, basically totalitarian in structure, uh, they were given the rights of persons, not by legislation, but by the courts. And uh, Adam Smith turned over his brain a harsh attack against classical liberalism. They got rights of persons. In the last 10 or 20 years, they've got rights way beyond persons. I mean, like if General Motors goes to Mexico, right, they can claim the rights of a Mexican. They can claim what's called national treatment. And what happens to a Mexican if he happens to show up in Austin? Can he claim national treatment? That. Now, these are rights that only go to attorneys. They don't go to people. So now they have rights way beyond people. That's only one of them. Uh, and uh, they have tremendous power. And they're very closely linked to the powerful states and to international economic institutions. And they basically are the masters of the world. Uh, and out of that comes aggression. For just the reasons I quoted in the National Intelligence Review. You know, you want to have Act, you want to protect commercial interests and investment, and that means force. You have to control the growing numbers of have-nots who get disruptive and so on, and that requires force. Uh, and uh, you have to uh, not only have access to oil and say in the Middle East, you have to run it, control it, because that gives you a stupendous source of strategic power, to veto power over others. Uh, out of that comes aggressive behavior. But it's not, it's not human nature. Today, we have one question. We have one, one more question. Yeah. 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 High level of economic concentration is a good example, but not a perfect example, of being the trilateral commission, the influence they have to dictate foreign policy and how we as Americans can counteract that with explosives. See, I don't think the trilateral commission actually has influence over foreign policy. The Trilateral Commission is a, if you read their reports, I suggest you read them, it's mostly a horrible bore. It's like reading you know, foreign affairs or something like that. I mean, it's a group of very powerful people. And incidentally, those are the kind of liberal internationalist wing. You know, it's not the Bush guy. Uh, and they do bring together lots of powerful people. But the, they themselves, as, a, as an entity, they don't have any power. And it's a mistake to look for that kind of concentration of power. I mean, this is the way the states work. They don't put power in the hands of, you know, international institutions like this. Well, that's true, and then Washington, the overarching thing, 
was getting in to unlock when in Washington last year. I'm sorry. Can you find that? When the Trilateral Commission met. When the Trilateral Commission met. It was so boring to read the intention. It really is boring. Read their proceedings. That's a bunch of rich guys getting together and talking about how they'd like things to happen, but they don't have any power. I mean, as the members of it do, you know, what they represent has power, okay, but not the commission. So I, I think we miss, at least my feeling is we mislead ourselves when we look at the uh, Trilateral Commission and Bilderberg and those things. Um, those are places where rich guys go to have their grown-up frat parties. <laughs> Unless 
unless people know that you have to. Like if I have nuclear weapons stored in my garage, uh, they don't, they're of no use for threatening anybody or deterrence unless somebody knows I have them. Right? So therefore, uh, if he was ever planning to do anything with them, they'd have to make sure that he has them. Okay, the instant that happens, Iraq gets obliterated. Okay? I mean, if he moved a soldier toward the border, goodbye Iraq. I mean, that's what nobody's afraid uh, There's an effort to conjure up fear here, but for other reasons. Because they're dead set on a war, and they want to divert people away from what's going on here, and they want to take over those resources. It's got nothing to do with nuclear weapons. In fact, if they care, just think it through for a second. Suppose that anybody really took seriously what they're saying. Okay, suppose they, let's believe it for a moment. Suppose that Saddam Hussein is developing weapons of mass destruction, and we've got to get rid of them, we've got to destroy them, destroy them, not just hold them back with inspectors, but destroy them and get rid of the weapons of mass destruction and then gain access to Iraqi oil. And a really trivial way to do it, which isn't discussed. And we could ask, what? Well, that's a lunatic idea, I'm not suggesting it. Uh, but it's less lunatic than what's being proposed. It's never discussed. So it would answer all these problems in no time. Uh, encourage Iran to invade Iraq. Encourage Iran to invade Iraq if they need any help, or give them some logistic help, or maybe bomb from a distance or something. Uh, perfect solution. I mean, if Iran takes over Iraq, uh, they'll tear Saddam Hussein to shreds. They hate him. They'll destroy every weapon of mass destruction, not of his, but of any successor regime, because it's the uh, main thing that they're scared of. Uh, there won't be any American casualties. There won't be any Israeli casualties. Now, they'll be happy to give the U.S. access to the oil. Now, they have much better credentials than we do. Remember, the guys in Washington were supporting <coughs> Saddam Hussein right through his worst atrocities, right past everything they're now accusing him of, like gassing Kurds and stuff. They continue to support him and provide him with weapons of mass 